Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, the, the theme of this conference is culture clash. And there is a culture clash that's near and dear to my heart that has affected me in my work. And that is the war on science. So in case you haven't heard, there's been an ongoing war on science. And um, there's been a lot written about it. And the combatants in this war are the scientists on one side and everybody else on the other. That includes the public and the media. So the first casualty of this war has been the truth. And now we have a situation where large numbers of people think that man did not land on the moon, that vaccines cause autism, that climate change is a hoax. And this is a, a dangerous level of ignorance. So what's the roots of this war? If you ask the public, they will tell you it's the scientists. The scientists are in cahoots with industry. The um, government has a vigorous conspiracy with the scientists against the public. Um, they don't trust the scientists. If you ask the scientists, they'll tell you, oh, well, this is a general failure of the American educational system. It is a cutting of funding to science by the federal government. And it is a general anti-intellectual climate that's on the rise in the United States. Really. Uh, so I'm a scientist, but I have a slightly different take on that. And before I get into that, I want to tell you a little story, a story that predates the war on science. So I first got interested in science when I went to the Museum of Natural History in New York on a class trip. And I like the stuffed zebras as much as anybody else. But the thing that fascinated me was actually something I found in the gift shop, which is one of these radiometers. So a radiometer is basically, um, you've probably seen these things. They're like little glass light bulbs, and they have a little weather vane in there. You put them in the sun, and they spin. So I thought this was absolutely amazing. There's no electricity involved. I bought one of these things. I took it home. I played with it for a few weeks. Could never figure out what was going on. I moved to other things. But that was the thing that started me on science. What I didn't know at the time was that this was not some newfangled invention that the museum had. This had actually been around for nearly 100 years. It was invented by William Crookes in 1873. And Crookes was a scientist who liked to play with gadgets. And he made this. He didn't know what it was doing either. But, um, but uh, he sold lots of them. And scientists and the public were enthralled with this. And uh, it later became known that there's a, the explanation is currents of air in there. There's a heat differential between the, the white side of the pane and the black side of the pane. And that causes currents, and that causes it to spin. But the other thing I didn't know is that this was not Crookes' most outstanding invention. This is Crookes' most outstanding invention. This is another type of tube. This is called a Crookes tube. And in this tube, there is no air. It's a vacuum. And it has a, uh, a little metal uh, Maltese cross that's on a stand halfway down. And you, you put elect there are electrodes there. And you hook it up to a high voltage power supply. And you turn off the lights. And this is what you see. The tube glows very brilliantly in the dark. And this was fascinating for people at that time. And not only that, if you take a magnet and you move it around the edge, you can distort that cross and do all kinds of crazy things with it. Um, it's, uh, it was absolutely amazing thing, not only to the scientists, because they had no idea how it worked, but also to the public. Here's a picture of Mark Twain playing with his Crookes tube. So these were all over the place. People were, were absolutely fascinated with them. And uh, two Nobel Prizes were won by scientists trying to figure out what was going on with the Crookes tube. So uh, not to keep you in suspense, the story is that when you apply voltage across there, the uh, cathode electrode heats up and starts to emit small charged particles that get accelerated by the voltage to the under, other end of the tube. They hit the glass. There's fluorescent material in the glass, and, they, and the glass starts to fluoresce. And they call those things cathode ray tubes. And we know, now know them as electrons. So, but the most interesting thing about this tube has nothing to do with the cathode rays. That's, that's not even half the story. The real story is that these tubes emitted another type of ray that no one knew about. 
And this type of ray was discovered accidentally by this man, Wilhelm Rankin. Rankin was a German physicist. He was playing with his tube, and he discovered a ray that could go through matter. This was completely unknown at the time, that any rays could go through matter. He also ruled out that it was, had anything to do with the cathode uh, rays because they, they were not charged particles. They couldn't be bent with a magnet. They were a new type of ray. And he went on to publish a paper called On a New Type of Ray. And he showed in that paper this photograph. This is the first x-ray ever taken. It is the x-ray of Rankin's wife's hand. But the thing that Rankin did, he published his paper but he simultaneously sent that photograph to the newspapers. And you didn't need to have any text or narrative to go along with that photograph. People immediately recognized the utility of this new technology. So he sent it to a newspaper in Paris because he had a friend whose, son was, uh, who, whose father was a, an editor in Paris. And this spread like wildfire throughout the rest of the world. Within a month, there was virtually no one in the world, no educated person in the world, who hadn't heard about Rentkin and his x-rays. Well, when the story got to Canada, there were some doctors at McGill Hospital, and they uh, had a patient with a bullet in his leg, and they could not find the bullet. One of the doctors read the story in the newspaper, ran out and got a Crookes tube, brought it back to the hospital, they x-rayed the guy's leg, they took out the bullet and saved his leg. At the same time, in Chicago, there was a medical student. And this medical student was paying his way through college by working in a Crooks tube factory. And he was having this problem that his hands kept getting burned, and he couldn't figure out what was going on. Then he read in the newspaper about Rankin and the x-rays, and he concluded that the x-rays were burning his hand. So he went into, into school, and he's talking to his professors. And one of the professors said, if, if x-rays can burn normal tissue, perhaps they can burn out cancers. The very next day, they brought in a patient who had a breast tumor. They treated her with x-rays. They gave her a total of 18 treatments, and the tumor shrunk. As you can imagine, people were making a beeline to, um, to, to, to this guy to have their cancers treated. This spread from him to other doctors. Soon people were treating cancers with x-rays all over the world. Three years later, the first cure was reported. Now I want you to keep in mind that Rankin reported his results on December 29th, 1895. Between that day and the day of the first treatment was just 30 days. So we had the first diagnostic x-ray, we had the first therapeutic uh, use of x-rays. Not only that, the guy who had his leg shot used the x-ray in court to sue the guy who shot him. <laughs> so um, the scientific community was absolutely fascinated with this. In fact, so many people were working on this. Within a year, there was, there, there was an x-ray journal devoted specifically to x-rays. And I like to point the cover out to you here. So this is a cover, and what you see here is science depicted as an angel holding a crook's tooth over the world and, and, and bathing it in benevolent x-rays to the benefit of everyone. <laughs> the public was also thrilled with this. It was very well covered in the, uh, in the mainstream press. Here's a cartoon for Life magazine. The public was interested, but they didn't exactly understand how it works, and they had their own peculiar ideas about what to do with it. So whatever happened to Rankin? Rankin was recognized by his colleagues by winning the Nobel Prize, the first Nobel Prize in physics. And the public, he was an absolute celebrity. Not until Einstein showed up on the scene had any scientist ever been so, uh, so celebrated in, in, around the world. Not only that, in his home country of Germany, he was practically worshipped. They made a statue of him. They put it on a bridge in Berlin. And that statue stood there for 50 years. It survived the First World War, and it almost survived the Second World War. But in the last weeks of the Second World War, as the Allies were circling Berlin, the Nazis melted it down for its metal. Today on that bridge, we have a centaur embracing a fish. <laughs> so 
So much for the war on science. So the public may have forgotten Rankin, but our curiosity persists. So why is this war on science? Well, I have my own battle scars with the war on science. About 15, 20 years ago, I was, uh, I was interviewed by a reporter. He wanted to do supposedly a story about radiation. So I spent about 45 minutes with him. And uh, what he did was he turned around and he wrote the most sensational, scary article about radiation you can believe. And he used my quotes out of context to support it. So basically, he had deceived me. He had deceived the public. And he had used my name to give his article credibility. And so I decided that I was never going to speak to the press again, that they couldn't be trusted. And for about 15 or 20 years, I never spoke to the media again. And then this happened. When the accident happened at Fukushima, again, the media asked me to speak. And my initial reaction was, no, don't do it. They're just going to screw it up again. But during that time, I had seen a lot of people, supposed radiation experts, get on the news, tell people all types of preposterous things, and cause all kinds of trouble. And so I thought about this and decided to, that I would uh, relent. So I agreed to do some newscasts, and um, I became that guy on TV. And what I didn't know is I did some local newscasts in Washington, D.C., and that got picked up by the national networks. Pretty soon, over the, over the following week or so, I was on TV almost every day, most, mostly with CNN asking one question or another. One particular day that, that is striking to me is a day when um, they released radioactive water into the ocean. And CNN asked me to come down and comment on this. So they told me, 11,000 tons of water, radioactive water, have been released in the ocean. Come down and, and comment about the health effects of this. So I get in the cab, and I'm riding down there, and I'm thinking, like, uh, tons? Like, who measures water in tons? You know, you, you don't go to the gas station and say, give me a quarter of a ton of gas. You don't do that. So I, I get out my calculator. I convert this to a volume. And then I think to myself, well, what, I need a picture of this, so a mental picture of this. So I converted it to... Olympic swimming pools of water. Turns out, 11,000 tons of water is five Olympic swimming pools. And then thank God for Google, because then I just Googled how much water is in the Pacific Ocean. And then I converted that into swimming pools. And if you're curious, it's 300 trillion swimming pools of water. <laughs> so when I got down to CNN, they put me with a question, and that's the answer I gave them. And then I went on to explain how dilution would quickly happen, and it would be dissipated, and I didn't think there was going to be much of a, a health problem. And then two days later, I decided, I wonder if anybody picked up that analogy and is using that analogy. So I Googled my exact quote, and I got 9,600 hits. So what this told me, it wasn't that people weren't interested in the science, but they wanted to get that science in digestible form. They wanted it in a way they could understand. So after I had gotten all this exposure, I started getting telephones and emails from the public because they'd either see me on TV or they Googled and my name came up. And so I started getting questions. A lot of them started with Fukushima, but then there were all kinds of questions. <laughs> so the people that were asking these questions were ed highly educated people. They were doctors, lawyers, and, and, um, and they had intelligent questions, but they just didn't, there was no way these people could get the information they needed. And although um, I was happy to talk to people five or 10 minutes on the phone, this was not an efficient way to get this information out there. So I decided that I would write a book targeting this audience. And I talked to my colleagues about this, and their advice, don't do it. <laughs> Why? They said, you will ruin your career. You will lose your credibility. Because in their view, in order to talk to the public, you had to dumb down the science. And if you dumb down the science, you would lose your credibility. And so they thought this was a terrible idea. But I thought about it for a while, and I decided, decided to go ahead and do it. So I wrote a book with this audience in mind, an educated, interested audience. And I, and I wrote the book in stories. Every chapter is a story about a person. I already told you Rankin's story. There are also stories about the radium girls, their story about a family that had to move out of their house because of radon contamination, their story about Edison nearly going blind from radiation, their story about nuclear bombs, cell phones, etc. And by personalizing that and telling a story so that you read the story and then you need a piece of technical information to understand where the story is going. So you stick a little technical information, kind of like a Trojan horse. By the time you get to the end of the book, you have absorbed a tremendous amount of radiation. Uh, not radiation. <laughs> 
Freudian slip on that one. So, so, uh, so anyway, the book was released and I was scared because I thought maybe the public will like it, the scientists will hate it, maybe the scientists will like it and the public, or maybe everyone will hate it. So I waited for the reviews and I'm happy to say that the reviews have been uniformly positive. I haven't gotten a bad review on this book. So I was quite gratified by that, but something still bothered me. And that was that some of these reviews had this negative preamble. So here's an example. I approach this book with low expectations. <laughs> How about this one? What I did not expect was to enjoy this. And so this kind of upset me because I thought, have we so turned off the public that they aren't even willing to listen? No matter what you do, no matter how you do it, you, the, you are going to get a deaf ear to this. And so I was quite de depressed about this. And then I got an email. And the email was from someone who had read the book. He was a Boy Scout counselor. And he had read the book and he had used it to instruct the Boy Scouts about earning their nuclear science merit badge. And yes, there is such thing as a nuclear science merit badge. So that made me think that maybe we have lost the adult generation, but the youth are still available to us. Now Carl Sagan said this, every kid starts out as a natural born scientist and then we beat it out of them. And I think this is absolutely true. So here is my take on the war on science. My take on the war on science is that scientists have to accept some of the blame for this war because they have failed to communicate the joy of scientific discovery. And that if scientists want to be better understood by the public, they have to take ownership of the narrative. And they cannot rely on the media to do that in their best interests. The other thing is that if the scientists want to communicate, they have to drop the graphs, drop the tables, drop the equations, speak to the public in, without the jargon, in normal terms, in, in stories. And they have to concentrate that message on the youth because they are the most receptive. So I'd like to conclude by saying, I believe that this war has to stop. And I think the scientists need to make, first need to make peace with the public before we can make any progress. Thank you very much.